Hi, I'm Tommy DePaola. I'm an artist and I write and illustrate books for children. You know, I get thousands and thousands and thousands of letters every year from all of my fans. And I also get lots of invitations to come and visit. But of course, I can't do that because I'm too busy here at home. So I thought it'd be fun if you came to visit me here in my house and my studio. Here I am in the entryway to my house. Across the courtyard is my 200-year-old barn studio. It's got an attached shed that has another studio in it where I do my illustration work. Uh, but you'll see that in a little while, so a little later. So but first, I want you to come and see my house. This is one room in my house. My friends call it the great room. I guess it's because the ceilings are so tall. You'll notice that it's all painted white. Well, there's a, there's a reason for that. It's because I love white walls, because I treat them like they're a piece of paper or a canvas, and I put things against them, and I can arrange those things and rearrange those things. And there's lots and lots of folk art in here. You'll see, if, if you come to visit, you'll see that there's lots and lots of folk art, uh, because I love folk art and I collect folk art. I look out in a beautiful garden, and occasionally there's some black crows that walk around and eat the apples or eat things. And I have some black crows inside, too. These are done by Navajo artists. Over here on this table is, is kind of interesting, because um, I have a heart collection. And I have some of my best examples of, of my heart collection on this table. But this is one I want to show you in particular. This was given to me by a friend of mine for my birthday. It's a maple sugar candy mold in the shape of a heart. But what's really interesting, there's a tea carved into that heart. So it was just as if this was made for me. And this is one of my favorite hearts. in my kitchen and I'm getting ready to make um, some pasta and I'm going to make my favorite pasta, one of my favorite pasta sauces, which is made from leeks and fennel and uh, Belgian endive and garlic. And I haven't decided which kind of pasta I'm going to make yet. Um, I'm either going to make these curly cues, which are long, or these wagon wheels, or fusilli, which is like corkscrews. I love to cook. I love to cook ever since I was a little boy. In fact, one of the true stories is that when I was five years old, we had a thing in our family that when, on your birthday, you could get to do one thing that you wanted. And when I was five, my parents said to me, OK, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to cook my own supper. <laughs> so um, they tied an apron around me and put a chair be by the uh, um, stove. And I guess a parent on either side, maybe with a fire extinguisher, who knows. But I cooked my favorite thing at that time, which was called a Popeye. and. This is very interesting. This is the actual frying pan, little grizzle frying pan that I made my Popeye in. I'll quickly, quickly give you the recipe. You take a piece of bread, and you cut a hole in the middle of it, and then you fry the hole, and then you fry one side of the bread, then you turn the bread over, and you break an egg right in the hole. And um, I guess that's why it's called a Popeye, because the egg kind of pops up over the top of the bread. Then you take the little hole that you cut out and you put that on the top and you eat it. And if I remember rightly, it was delicious. No, I haven't had one of those in a long time. Maybe I should try it again for breakfast um, or dinner or whatever. But I've loved this little frying pan. It has a special place of honor on my wall with all my pots and pans. 
and I hang pots and pans just like I hang pictures, and I decorate my counter, but everything is right here so I can grab it and use it uh, when I'm cooking, because I do cook every day, even for myself. Here we are outside, and I want you to get a look at my gardens. Um, I love flowers, and I guess it's because being an artist, you know, color and beauty are a very important part of my life. Here I am in my courtyard, and I'm on my way to work. Even though my barn and studio are right close to the house, I still commute to work every morning. I cross this beautiful New Hampshire cobble courtyard, which I designed myself, to make it look a little bit Italian, because after all, I am half Italian. This is the door to my illustration studio, and this is where I go in every morning. Now notice the sign on the door. It says, five dogs loose inside. Do not open door. Let someone from inside open it for you. Well, I don't have to let somebody open it for me because after all, they are my dogs. But if a stranger comes, we do ask that they wait until we open the door for them because the dogs are so friendly, they jump all over them. Come on, let's go inside. <laughs> Come on, Ma. Oh, Bingley, Bingley, shush. Come here, sit. Everybody sit. Come on, Every all right, everybody sit. Moffat, sit. Moffat, sit. Sit. Morgie, sit. Madison, sit. Marcus, sit. Oh, good dogs. Oh, what good dogs. Oh, good, good, yeah. OK, yes. We're here in my 200-year-old barn studio. This is a beautiful, beautiful space, and this is where I do all my work. Every artist has a studio. I'm happy to have such a big one because I do my fine art here, where I'm standing right now, and my book illustration in another part of the studio, which was an old shed. Here in this part of the studio, the big barn, um, I keep all my archival books, which means all the copies of every book of mine that's ever been published. I have my paintings that have been stored here, paintings I did when I was in art school, even a few that I did in high school, and paintings I've done recently. I'm getting ready for another one-man show right now. M many people don't know that I do paintings as well as children's book illustrations. And um, sometimes I get ideas for my books from doing paintings. So it's very important for me to keep my finger in with my fine art. This painting that I'm working on is for a show that I'm going to have. And right at the moment, I think it's going to be a watermelon. But I never know, because it might turn into an apple or a pear or maybe even a sunset. But right at the moment, it's going to be a watermelon. Uh, why don't you come with me and we'll look at some of the other paintings I've done. This table here is filled with all kinds of stuff. First of all, there are all these canvases that I've um, put gesso on, and they're all ready for me to start painting on. And uh, here are some paintings that I've already finished. But what I do the next step is I put down a background color. Uh, I know what's the idea that's going to go on these three. Now, you'll see these canvases lined up in threes or in twos. That's because for my next show, I'm doing triptychs, which are three paintings together, and diptychs, which are two paintings together, and then some individual paintings as well. These little ones are already done. These two sets of triptychs are already done. Uh, and this one here with the hearts is influenced by Mexican folk art. I love Mexican folk art. In fact, this big painting, which I did in 1995, is called Frida's Table. And it's, uh, Frida is Frida Kahlo. She was a very famous Mexican artist. And this is um, um, a Mexican dinner. Here's some chilies with green salsa, and some tortillas, and some corn, and some regular salsa, and these pottery plates with paintings on them, and a big flower in the middle with a bright tablecloth. And I pretended that I was up above the table, looking right down on top of it. But very, very influenced by Mexican folk art. Now, a friend of mine gave me this wonderful box here as a gift. It's called 
are saints of the dashboard. And I love it. It's, it's really, it's a piece of folk art and loads of fun. But I also noticed that the edges of the box were painted. So it gave me an idea to make some boxes of my own. And here's some examples of those. You can see where I painted the edges. Um, these are boxes with glass that I bought. And I've made little boxes, um, little little kind of shrines, I guess you could call them. And I've used other materials like beans. Uh, these beans were growing in my yard. Um, I had some beans that were used as a covering for a big lattice a trellis. And so I used those beans. And they, they were beautiful. They're purple and black. And these are peas. And there's some chilies inside there and some candles, et cetera. Well, doing these little shrine boxes, these are make-believe flowers, I got ideas to do some other boxes. In fact, some of the bean pods were so interesting that I actually painted them and used them in these boxes. And I painted some little birds that I found in a store. So I guess you'd say found object boxes. But these paintings here, these little tiny paintings, these I call my warm-up paintings. Because I was having trouble with my wrist and my arm um, and uh, from autographing so much. So every morning, uh, when I came to work in my studio, I do these little paintings. I had all the little pieces of paper. And some of them are almost the size of a postage stamp. And I would paint a little painting every morning just to warm my hand up so I could get on with my illustration work. And uh, so I liked them so much, I saved them all. And I had a show of these little paintings. They look very nice in these bigger frames. And of course, over here are some books. There's always books in here, always books everywhere. <laughs> books in these very special bookcases with glass doors that pull down to protect the books are my archival collection. That means that this is um, in these shelves are a copy of every single book that I've illustrated or written in every single edition, including the foreign editions. It takes up so far eight bookcases, but I'm still working, so I'm going to have to buy some new bookcases because they're all filled up. Everything from my very first book that I illustrated down to the very latest one that I've illustrated. Now over here, in these gray cases, these metal gray files, is all the original artwork that I've done. And it's all in alphabetical order. And some of it is sold. But I keep a piece from every single book that I've illustrated, um, recently anyway, for my own collection. And everything is very well protected with this acid-free paper on it. But I've taken the paper off of some of these pictures so you can see them yourself. These, this is an illustration from Tom. And this was in an exhibition. That's why it has this mat on it. This is a, uh, an illustration from Streganona's Magic Lessons, where Streganona is telling Big Anthony to go give Signora Rosa her dress back. This is kind of interesting because you can see the marks that are called crop marks and little notes that are from the printer and it says what page it is on there. So that's kind of interesting. And here's an illustration from my 100th book, which was The Night Before Christmas. So I do have a copy of, um, or a, a, a piece of artwork from almost every one of my books that I keep for my own collection. You know, a lot of people wonder where Streganona, who's probably my most famous character of all the characters in my books, except maybe the character of Tommy, who's me, um, where she came from. And I used to teach, and I was teaching at a college here in New Hampshire where I live, and um, we had to go to faculty meetings every week. And I used to sit in the back row and doodle on my pad because everyone thought I was being very, very conscientious and uh, um, taking notes. Well, I wasn't taking notes at all. I was doodling. And one day, this little old lady kind of appeared on my doodle pad. And um, I, um, I, I just kept that doodle and put it on my studio wall and became Streganona. Now, I've drawn Streganona hundreds and hundreds of times. 
Um, and I always start with a line like this, and I've done it in pencil first this time, but, and a circle. And then I always start with her kerchief. And I don't know why, but it just makes me feel comfortable starting with her kerchief. If I get the kerchief right, then I can get her face right. And I love to draw her in profile because she's probably related to Punchinello because she's got a great big nose and a great big chin. And I just do a little dot for her eye, just a little tiny dot, with two little lines coming down it, and a nice big curve line for her smile, because Stregadona is most of the time pretty happy. Only when Big Anthony gets into trouble does she um, get a little perturbed. Now, Stregadona has a great big fat fanny, because she eats so much pasta. But that's all right. I said to um, a group of school children recently that Stregonona built me a swimming pool. And this little girl in the audience said, Stregonona built your swimming pool? And because I had this great image, this little girl thought that Stregonona was out in my meadow with a shovel digging this hole for my swimming pool. What I meant was that a new book that I did of Stregonona sold so well that I had enough money to, to buy a swimming pool. The Stregonona didn't actually build it, but I'm going to call it the Stregonona swimming pool anyway. But I want this to look really kind of nice and fluid and flowy. So I'm using lots of water with this as well. These are all things that I kind of learned along the way when I was in art school and then just doing lots and lots of books. You learn as you, I learn anyway. I learn as I do things. I think that's how I learned how to cook, and how I learned how to draw, and how I learned how to write books, and um, how I learned how to tap dance when I was little. Because <laughs> I did, I tap dance for a long time. <laughs> when I was in dancing school, I had a dancing partner named Carol, Carol Morrissey, and we were senor and senorita swing. Uh, that, that's kind of a, a funny title, because swing was a big kind of a a dance craze. Everybody was doing swing, sort of like jitterbugging. Some of the, some of the teachers out there will remember what swing was. <laughs> but I remember, almost everybody knows that my trademark is a heart. So I think I'll make this a very extra special apron for Stregonona. Make it a heart apron. I don't know whether you can tell or not from the way I'm painting these, but I just, I, I, I'm so happy when I'm sitting here at my drawing table painting. I just love to paint. I love the way, to watch the way the colors come together and land on the paper. Oh, I forgot something very important here. Very important. It's a little heart, which is my trademark. And then I put the T right around the heart. And I love books. I can't imagine not, um, not loving reading, to be perfectly honest. And I like to tell my young friends that if you can read, if you can read, you can learn everything about anything and anything about everything. You have to really pay attention to that sentence because it's really very true. You can learn everything about anything and anything about everything. If you, you want to be a writer, you have to read. And you have to read everything you can because that's how you learn about writing, oddly enough. And then once you've read enough and feel confident that you too can tell a story, then you also have to practice. And you have to do, be willing to do it over and over and over again. Uh, whenever I write a story, I know that the first draft is not going to be the way the story turns out when it's published in a book. That, and a lot of young people don't like to do that. They don't like to do it over again. But if, um, if you want to be a writer, you better get used to it, because you're going to have to. I have twin cousins, and um, they're both artists, or well, they're photographers, but they were going off to art school when I was a very little boy. And in the, in the book, The Art Lesson, the twins say to me, 
you know, um, the thing that was the most important thing that anyone ever said to me, and I still remembered it. They don't remember saying it to me, but I remember them telling me. And they said that real artists don't copy, and you must practice, practice, practice. Now, what they meant by real artists don't copy, I think, is means that you don't look at somebody else's idea. For instance, in school, there would be kids that could draw Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck, and I never did that. And when I go to schools now and children say, can you draw Snoopy? Can you draw so-and-so? And I say, no, I can't because I didn't make up that character. But I can draw Strega Nona. I can draw Bill and Pete. I can draw my characters or people that I've made up. And that's what, the, that's what it is meant by not copying, really trying to see and doing something for yourself. The very first book that I did that involved family memories was a book called Nana Upstairs and Nana Downstairs. And it was a book about my relationship with my 94-year-old great-grandmother. And I was only four years old. And it was on the Irish side of my family. I'm half Irish and half Italian. And that took a lot of courage to write about my own family. Um, it was very serious. And then I had a nightmare after I finished that book. And that book is still in print, as I said, and it's still a book that people love. And that sort of gave me a little bit of encouragement of maybe I should write about my family a little bit more. But I had a nightmare of, about my, it was my Italian grandmother standing on her front porch. And she called me my friend. That was her nickname. And she said, hey, my friend, come here. And I said, what, Nana? And she said, how come are you no write a book about me? And I woke up and I went, I will, Nana, I will. <laughs> and I did. And it's a book called Watch Out for the Chicken Feet in Your Soup. So I never know, you know, I never know where I'm going to get inspired, but my family has inspired lots of, uh, lots of ideas for stories. The more I look at, the more I think about them, the more ideas I get these days. So <laughs> my father had a movie camera when I was just a little boy, so it's, it's really wonderful. I have home movies of me when I'm a baby. It is funny watching my whole family. There's a wonderful scene of all the Italian relatives sitting, <laughs> sitting eating spaghetti, and everybody is just piling in the spaghetti. It's, they, they, it's, I suppose that's what inspired Big Anthony. <laughs> but yeah, um, it is fun looking at all those home movies and all my relatives. And I think some of the Irish relatives look pretty wacky, too. <laughs> I suppose I can see why I'm so crazy by looking at these movies. <laughs> I didn't have a chance. <laughs>